All right, so get this. We're diving into a literary mystery today. Oh, this is going to be good. Right. A real head scratcher. We're talking B. Griffin's Fidesa sonnets. Fidesa, okay. Yeah, and we're following this YouTube video that makes a wild claim. Let's hear it. They think Fidesa could be Christopher Marlowe in disguise. Whoa, Marlowe. But he died in like 1593, right? That's what everyone thinks. But this video is suggesting he might have faked his death. Hmm. And wrote under a pseudonym. That's a juicy theory. Super juicy. And they start with the name Fidesa itself. Interesting. So it's not just some random lover. Right. The video says it's working on like multiple levels. Like what? Well, on one hand, Fidesa could be the poet's muse. Yeah, makes sense. Classic sonnet stuff, inspiration and all. But the video also suggests it might be Queen Elizabeth I. Whoa, hold on, the queen. Yeah, especially with that subtitle, more chaste than kind. Oh, right, the virgin queen image. I see the connection. So maybe these sonnets are less about romantic love and more about... Loyalty to the queen. Duty versus personal feelings. Exactly. Like the author struggling with something they can't reveal. And so where pseudonyms come in, right? This was Elizabethan England, after all. Pseudonyms everywhere. It's like a conspiracy. It kind of was. The video mentions these scholars, Martha Footcrow and John Erskine. They studied all these sonnets. Tons of them. And they found a crazy trend in the 1590s. Like what? Poets were using female names for their collections left and right. Really? So was that just the style at the time? Seems like it. And guess when this trend explodes? 1593. When Marlowe disappears? No way! Yep, the video really points to that timing. Okay, that's kind of spooky. Yeah. But how do we get from pseudonyms to Marlowe actually being alive? So there's this other sonnet cycle, Phyllis, by Thomas Lodge. Okay. And the video claims one of the poems in there basically lays out Marlowe's fake death plan. Wait, seriously? Like, it's his confession hidden in plain sight? That's what they're arguing. They point to lines like, I have to live concealed. Ooh, that's sus fled the scene of fame. Definitely starting to sound like Marlar. And then, I felt that death I never would declare. Like he's saying he had to disappear. But couldn't that just be a poet being dramatic? You know, not necessarily Marlowe. It's possible, for sure. But the video doesn't stop there. They go on to analyze Fidesa itself. Oh, so they think there are clues hidden in the sonnets. Tons of them. One of the first examples is Sonnet 3 from Fidessa. It's almost identical to a sonnet in Shakespeare's The Passionate Pilgrim. Hold up. The same sonnet in both collections. That's a major red flag. Right. The video presents it as a possible link between the two authors. Whoa. Okay, so now we're talking Marlowe and Shakespeare. It's getting interesting. Mm -hmm. And that's just the beginning. There's a lot more they unpack. Okay, I'm hooked. What other smoking guns are they finding? Well, there's Sonnet 4, which they see as an allegory for Marlowe's staged death. An allegory? Like a secret code? Kind of. It involves this group called the German Brethren, who are caught up in this whole violent struggle. Sorry, Brethren, who are they? The video suggests they could represent real religious groups from back then, like the Anabaptists, maybe, or the Mennonites. I'm not super familiar with those groups. How do they tie back to Marlowe? Right. Maybe a little context would help. Christopher Marlowe was a pretty wild character. Yeah, he wrote Dr. Faustus, right? Exactly. Super talented, but controversial, too. Mm -hmm. He got in trouble for atheism, sedition, all sorts of things. Oh, yeah. He was questioned by the Privy Council, wasn't he? That's right. The Queen's advisors. So maybe Marlowe felt like his life was actually in danger and had to make a run for it. So he faked his death to escape. That would be crazy. Right. And it kind of lines up with some of his plays, like Dr. Faustus, mm -hmm. all about hidden deals and consequences. Ooh, interesting. Yeah, lots of disguise and different identities in his work. Like, it foreshadowed his own life. Okay, so back to Sonnet 4 and those German brethren. How do they fit into Marlowe's escape? Well, the video suggests they might have helped him disappear. Helped him? How do... Think about it. These groups often faced persecution. They had networks all over Europe. They could have smuggled him out of England, helped him get a new identity. So they're saying the sonnet is like a coded message to thank them. That's wild. It is wild. And the sonnet itself is all about betrayal and violence and a fake death. Really mirrors what might have happened to Marlowe. I'm starting to see the connections now. Are there other sonnets that point to Marlowe living in hiding? Definitely. The video focuses on sonnets 5, 6, and 27. They're all about isolation and darkness, feeling trapped. Oh, give me an example. Like worst of worst of pain to lie in darksome silence out of Ken. It sounds pretty bleak, right? Yeah, it definitely gives off those hiding in the shadows vibes. Right, like he can't reveal who he really is. Then there's sonnet 13. 
He compares himself to like Leander and a fly drawn to a flame. Oh yeah, I remember that one. <laughs> Always ending badly for those guys. Exactly. So why would he make that comparison? Well, the video argues it's because those figures represent actual death, but the author claims he died to live. So he's dead to the world, but secretly alive. Exactly. And that same idea pops up in works by George Witters and Giles Fletcher, too. Wait, are you saying they might be Marlowe in disguise, too? That's what the video proposes. It's like this web of hidden connections. This is getting crazy. And it gets even crazier. In Sonnet 26, the poet compares himself to a bird in a net and a fly drawn to a flame. Hold on, we just saw those images in Sonnet 13. You got it. And guess what? George Withers has an emblem with almost the exact same imagery. A fly dying in a flame. Okay, now I'm convinced there's something going on here. So what's the final nail in the coffin? Which sonnet really makes the case for Fidessa being Marlowe's autobiography? They save the best for last. Sonnet 53, it's all about a banished king cast down from heaven to hell. Whoa, dramatic. Right, and the video argues this is Marlowe talking about his own fall from grace. He was like the king of the London theater scene, and then suddenly he's gone. Exactly. So the video reads Sonnet 53 as Marlowe telling his story in code. So Fidessa is his message to the world. This is mind-blowing. It's a wild theory, for sure. But before we go too far down the rabbit hole, we should maybe take a step back. Yeah, good idea. This is a lot to process. What would this all mean for how we see Marlowe? And for Elizabethan literature in general? So many questions. Right, we're barely scratching the surface here, but I'm ready to keep digging. Let's take a quick pause, though, and we'll come back to explore Fidessa and the Marlowe mystery even deeper. So we're dealing with a potential literary bombshell here, Fidessa, these sonnets, maybe Christopher Marlowe's secret autobiography while he was supposedly dead. It's wild. It really is a lot to process. What's crazy is how different Marlowe looks now. Right, not just a tragic figure, but maybe someone who took control of his story. Totally. But why would he go through all that? What was so bad he had to fake his death? Yeah, what was he running from? The video doesn't really say. True, but we know from history, Marlowe was a controversial guy. Accused of all sorts of things, atheism and whatnot. Right, and remember, he was questioned by the Privy Council. The Queen's advisors, yeah. So maybe Marlowe felt like he was in real danger, like his life was on the line. It makes sense. Faking his death might have been his only way out. Or maybe he was just tired of the fame and wanted to live a quiet life, right, without all the scrutiny. That's interesting. It's making me think about Dr. Faustus and that whole deal with the devil. Oh, how so? Well, Faustus gets all this knowledge and power, but it destroys him in the end. Right. So maybe Marlowe felt like fame was his own deal with the devil, something he had to escape. That's a cool connection. And this idea of hiding and faking his death, it fits with his plays. Yeah, all those disguises and secret identities like he was foreshadowing his own life in his work you know totally but what about shakespeare if marlowe was still around wouldn't that have messed with shakespeare's career good question the video touches on this actually they suggest marlowe might have been involved with shakespeare's work whoa are they saying marlowe wrote shakespeare's plays it's not that clear cut they focus more on the connections between fidessa and some of shakespeare's early stuff like the passionate pilgrim okay so not all of shakespeare just some early works yeah, and remember, collaborating on plays was pretty common back then. Right, everyone was using pseudonyms, too. It's like a giant literary puzzle. It really is. But even if we can't prove Marlowe wrote Shakespeare's plays, this idea that he might have lived in hiding and kept writing, it changes everything. It opens up so many questions, like what else did he write, and how does that change how we see Elizabethan literature as a whole? It's like finding a hidden thread that connects everything in a new way. It makes you wonder when other secrets are hiding in plain sight. It makes you want to reread all those plays and poems looking for clues. Totally. Okay, so if Marlowe was alive and writing, how does that change how we experience these works? That's a great question. I mean, the plays and poems themselves are still amazing, whoever wrote them. Right. But knowing about Marlowe's possible involvement, it adds a whole new level of intrigue. Like a secret code waiting to be cracked. Exactly. And even if we never definitively solve this mystery, just thinking about these questions makes us look at the era and the whole idea of authorship in a new way. It reminds us that there's always more to the story. And that our understanding of history is always changing. This has been such a wild ride so far. I can't believe how much we've uncovered. We're just getting started. There's so much more to explore. We could dig deeper into the video's arguments or look at the historical context or even compare Fidessa to other works. So many possibilities. As we wrap up this part of the deep dive, 
What should our listeners be thinking about? What's the big takeaway? I think one thing to keep in mind is history, especially when we're talking about literature. It's not always clear cut. Yeah, like they say, history is written by the winners, right? But here, it's like someone tried to erase their own story. Exactly. And that makes it harder to figure out, but also way more interesting. It's like we're trying to put together a puzzle where half the pieces are missing. This whole deep dive has made me wonder, can we ever really know who wrote something? Especially with all these pseudonyms. That's the big question, isn't it? Scholars have been debating that forever. No easy answers there. Right. But maybe accepting that there could be multiple authors or people working together or even ghostwriters, maybe that makes us appreciate the creative process even more. Yeah, like art doesn't always come from one lone genius, right? Exactly. It could be a group effort, a bunch of people bouncing ideas around. A literary jam session. I like that. And with Fidesa, if this theory is right, it changes how we see not just Marlowe, but the whole Elizabethan scene. Totally. Like maybe there was this whole network of writers, a secret society doing things we never even knew about. It's like a spy novel, a secret group controlling everything behind the scenes. Right. And who knows what other mysteries are still out there waiting to be discovered. It's funny. We think of history as this fixed thing, but this deep dive shows how much it can change depending on how you look at it. And what's really cool is that this challenges us to rethink what we believe, to question the official story and be open to other possibilities. It reminds us there's always more to learn, more to uncover. So as we wrap up, what's the one thing you'd want our listener to walk away with? The big question to ponder. I'd say approach any story about the past, especially about who wrote what, with a little bit of doubt. Mm -hmm. Don't just take things at face value, dig a little deeper, look for different viewpoints. You never know what you might find. Great advice. I think we've given everyone a lot to chew on today. Who knows, maybe one of our listeners will be the one to solve this mystery, the next clue in the Marlowe and Fidesa puzzle. There are definitely more secrets out there in libraries and archives just waiting to be found. Hmm. And each new discovery changes how we understand history. Well said. That's a wrap on our deep dive into Fidesa. We hope you've enjoyed this journey into the world of Elizabethan literature and the mystery of Christopher Marlowe. Until next time, keep exploring, keep asking questions, and never stop being curious.